I'm delighted to welcome on making his debut with Capital Sports, Jimmy Ashworth. Jimmy, a very warm welcome. You're all the way up in, uh, is it Bradford or Bingley? Scotland. Scot oh, even further north. There you go. <laughs> this, okay. this, thanks so for coming on. I um, want to ask you first of all, because I have a couple of questions for you from uh, Andrew Flint, one of my co-hosts. He's actually going to do a marathon next week. And I'll ask you, I'll tell you what he's doing in a moment. But um, first question, uh, what got you into marathon running to begin with or to running in general? I got, uh, I got involved in marathon running because I realised I wasn't fast enough to run on the track. <laughs> I would have always wanted to be an 800 metre runner, really. But, um, you know, within a week, <laughs> let's put it this way, within a couple of sessions, you realise you're not fast. <laughs> you know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's um, Sorry, go ahead, Jimmy. And that's why I got in into marathon running. I, I wanted to run for my country. And uh, at the time, that was the way for me. I could see that were a way forward to run for me, you know, get an international vest, and uh, which drove me on. And that's the main reason why I got in. You see, at the time when I belonged to Bingley Arias, uh, a really famous club, you know. And at the time, I was sort of training around with Stephen Binns, who a lot of. Uh, People will know Stephen Binns. Stephen Binns went to the Olympics. But at the time, just maybe, oh, maybe 1980, 1979, he held the, the junior European record for 5,000 metres. And it wasn't until a certain Norwegian came along. He brought the... So you can imagine what standard he was. So I'm looking at this guy and I'm just watching him go, shoom. And I'm thinking, yeah, I ain't fast. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's, 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 it's one of those things where you, you find your level. But listen, it wasn't as if you were any slouch because over the longer distance, you were terrific. I mean, some of your, your results just um, in placings in big marathons alone. I mean, you know, the Miami Marathon, which in the mid 80s was huge, was very, very famous. Uh, Berlin Marathon, of course, uh, you you won it and you also came runner up. Um, you run up, I think it was was it eighty three? You were runner up and eighty five. You won it. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah, eighty three second, of course, and eighty five. I won it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you also. I mean, you competed in the London Marathon. You you kept top ten in that, and you were also one of the top. Uh, non-American finishers in the New York City Marathon as well, around that time in 83, 84. Um, yeah, I think it was oh, I think it was 84 and, and also I think it was the 84 was the year when it was absolutely red hot and the humidity was 94 percent I believe and it, 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 were, it, were, it were grim <laughs> and, uh, in that, um, you know, when you run to those marathons, I used to ask, like, straight up about this. Uh, I always remember, for example, the Dublin City Marathon would get some good runners, but not the best runners. They wouldn't go to Dublin, whether it be the course or whatever. We always used to think. But it was all about money as well, wasn't it? I mean, it was like there was very good money to, you know, place high up in, in, in a marathon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can't really remember the price structure now, but it was it was good money yeah you're right it was good money at the time i mean i don't know what it is now well i'm lying i do i see i do see figures banded about where at the time it was good money but i don't not comparable to the to what the athletes were getting on the track at the time neither if i remember rightly i mean steve cram were uh, coining it in <laughs> really on the track I mean, we remember that, like Steve, the, the, the Steve O'Bett and and, and um, Steve Crown, of course. Then there was a certain man who's now in charge of World Athletics. We, we, they were all not around at that, that, that time with you. Oh, honestly, I mean that was terrific because I mean Steve Cram was kind of he was a he was a northeast boy, seen as a bit of an outsider, and yet he was on cereal boxes, which was a huge thing. He was he was massive. He was like a, an idol. This young, you know. Steve O'Bett was like tall, kind of balding, uh, thin. Steve Cram, tall, thin, but like curly blonde hair. Um, 
on that, I mean, um, just just on that, at the time, because you're coming through at that stage when there was yeah. really athletics and Irish athletics as well, because you've got Eamon Cochran, you've got John, you know, uh, I was John yeah. Delaney, Ryan Delaney, sorry, for John Tracy. I mean, uh, what was the competition like globally, the people you were taking on in marathons and beating in marathons as well, or being beaten by because it was great fields? Well, I, I suppose, the, the, you know, there were, there'd be world class, we were world class athletes, really. There'd be, uh, yeah, you know, if you could get top 10 in, in, in a marathon, you, you could honestly say, well, you were being some of the best in the world. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. But I mean, in next breath, it was something that it, it was, it sounds silly, it was what it was. You know, the athletes were there. And it, it, it's a race, so if you you know you have to win, <laughs> really that's how I look at it. You know? yeah. um, looking at now, I mean the, the time today, the winning time today in the Berlin Women's Marathon of two eleven fifty three, you you know, you beat that in eighty five by nine seconds, so you're yeah. faster by nine seconds. Yeah. Um, the people are, are like Adidas are holding up the shoes, the one once in a race shoes regardless of anything else she's taking um have humans advanced so far to make those times you've seen a two-hour barrier broken but not in a marathon but in a, in a race almost yeah. went today have have runners advanced that much i mean is is there such a huge difference in that jimmy well if the and if if we'd have advanced so much Surely, our European marathon runners would be on par with the current crop of uh, East Af African runners. You would have thought we we wouldn't be as far behind. That's what I'm trying to say. As we are, I mean, like this uh, this young lady has put the women's world record is in theory now it's like out of reach. And when you start, I mean, look at Charlotte today, Charlotte. Pro day is it? She runs two twenty two. That's eleven minutes behind. And I mean, she runs a PB, and she's a, she's a great competitor and a great runner. I mean, she must be shaking her head. This now thinking, I've gone and done this, but I aren't even sniffing around the the winning races like this now, which in reality, she should be. I, you know, I, I mean, what am I saying? I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big jump. Is two eleven. Yeah, and, and I, I don't want to like here on Capital Sports. We we're very, you know, we, we kind of look at things with a, a sideways look and kind of go, wait, hold on. If it if it walks like a duck, quacks, it's a duck. Uh, you know, we do know that testing, for example, of athletes in. East Africa is very lax. We do know as well that testing, as we've discussed before with different people from Robin, Robin Parasoto from who, who, who set up the, the dub testing for the two tests on the big in Sydney, yeah. like testing, for example, in America, the American college, the collegiate system is very lax or non-existent. Um, but it, it, putting aside the shoes, putting aside performance enhancing drugs, are people from East Africa, is it just because of the, is it the nature and the nurture that makes them so much better? And what can Europeans do to get that level? Do they have to go down to live and train in, in, in East Africa? Well, there's been quite a few Europeans that have gone and uh, lived and trained in East Africa. And the results, you know, uh, the young lad from, I think he's a, is he from Switzerland, Julian? Julian's, I can't remember his name, but uh, I mean, he's put the work in and, in and really the results don't reflect what he's put in. So I, I can't answer that. I can't answer that really. I, I, I find it hard to believe that we are so far behind. You know, you see something I, I can't get my head around and I can't, I just don't understand it. I think of, of take somebody like, well, I think of Dave Bedford when he brought the world record for 10,000 metres. Even now, it's a very respectable 
10,000 metres time. But we, we're not getting near those times. We are getting near them, but the, the, it's changed. Everything's changed to what it was. And I know I keep saying you should never compare, you know, what happened in that decade to this decade. There's so much has, has come forward, you know, with nutrition, training, recovery, as you said, the tracks are better, the shoes are better, etc. There's some big chunks of times in it, and I, I, and I can't grasp that as Europeans, we, we are competing somehow. You know, I'm not going to say necessarily the only competing ones really at the moment is the Norwegians and Norwegians, you know, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> we discussed Norway's before and the high rate of asthma and other things that they seem to be getting excuses for. So we, we you know, that that's their winter sports and their athletics as well. Um, on that, uh, I've mentioned before with an air, Dick Hooper, who you would have known, who uh, won the double marathon three times, you know, ran the Olympics as well. And, um, at a school's meet back, it would have been 1990 or 91, he was 91, spring of 91. And he said to some of the, our runners, because people were, see, were on the UCD track where I ended up going to university, a lovely track. And and he um, just turned around and someone mentioned something about now that the Eastern Europeans have, like, now it's all gone, so that means it's a chance for us to start to win. And he just simply said, uh, no, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but he said, he said, the people behind all of that, they're going to go and they're going to be, you know, you'll see other countries starting to rise up. Now, at the time you were running, I mean, if you look through the, the, the records, like one of the guys that you would have um, uh, come up against, uh, like, um, um, well, different different guys you would have sorry, uh, at different times, like Tommy Person from Sweden, for example, yeah. um, who went on and was, you know, getting beaten, like a very good runner, but being beaten by beaten by East Germans, for example, in European mm -hmm. Championships and so on. I think one in Helsinki, 83, it would have been, when our Eamon Cotton won the 5,000 metres. A lot of, the, when, when you were running, did you ever suspect, so the question is this, so that we, we had in Eastern Europe, when there were some of the East Europeans, not many I know, because of the time, but did you ever kind of suspect looking at them, there's something not quite right, these lot might be up to something? No, to be honest. <laughs> no, I never once thought it at the time, maybe because... Uh, it's all more you, you were aware of the drug situation but you know you've got to think it, it was the 80s and it was more related to the power type the explosive type events the sprints you know maybe the jumps and you know that kind of uh, thing this is way before epo and and things like that there's always been rumors of so-called blood doping but i never once thought for a minute, the, the East Europeans. I do remember in one race in America, uh, and I can't even remember which one it was, but some Polish guy, uh, he got uh, done for having drugs in his system. I don't know what, etc. but I, that's the only thing I remember. And I, and I actually remember yeah, in another race, a couple of Italians <laughs> which shooting off, and I remember thinking, wow this is different and that's it <laughs> i have you know yeah that's that one i suppose rush with drugs because of course you know it wasn't really a distance thing well that's why that, that that's that's what I, we mentioned again before we came on air but i, I, had, I had interviewed uh, a, a russian marathon runner um who had raced he said against uh he was well, i think he was he said that basically he was blown away um by uh some dutch and some belgians he said that they were very good they were they were good strong uh and had great stamina but you know th they were still like good at european level this would have been again early from mid mid uh, mid 80s and what he said was this now uh the, the guy is leaning to Mosev, and he said that 
uh, when they were running again, some some of the athletes he said from America, he said they seem the American runners seem to have a little bit more, as he said, more stamina. And what he said was more stamina than the Brits. Mm-hmm. And that was that was his thing. Um, when when did it for you? When did you start to notice then? As you know, when you like say for example you retired, when did you start to notice that something's up here. There's something. They have something now that that you know is making them last longer. I, I suppose really just watching the television, you know, on the the Olympics and things like that, and and you, you're looking at them. Not that you want them to fall over like Jim Peters did, but the, the finishing. It's like the current crop of cyclists. You know, they, they finish on top of climbs and things, and they're not knackered. And they, I'm not saying I want, I want them to be crawling home and spewing up and things like that, but they're showing no sign of fatigue. And you, you start thinking, well, I can remember how hard I trained. And this guy, is, you know, it, you know, I was world class at the time. So these guys are world class at the time. And you think, I mean, now, and you think, ensure sure that they look far better, etc., than what I did. I mean, you know, I finish a race. And every now and then, some some races, yeah, you, you feel good, but not all of them. You, you know, you're a bit like, yeah, you're knackered. <laughs> That's the top and bottom of it. And I, I do, I think, as I said, I, I remember two Italians racing away from me, and uh, and I could, I could not believe I could not believe how fast they actually raced away from me. And and as I got older and understand more about me, mean, son got involved in cycling and I understand more about cycling. And when you talk yeah, about just want, your, your sound just dropped a second. Sorry, you just we lost you when you said the two Italians raced away. Your sound just dropped for a moment. Yeah, the, the two, sorry, the two Italians just, I can know, I can see it now, raced away. And I thought, wow, I've, you know, I've not seen that before. And I can't really believe what's happening. It just didn't seem right because... I was going well, you know. I was run, and I can you can tell you're running well. You're not a fool, you know. If somebody's pulling away and you're feeling rough, yeah. But these went and they'd gone. And as you say, relating to like the Dutch and 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 the, and the Italians, not accusing anybody, but <laughs> with it we have through cycling, which I was made more aware of when my son got involved in cycling. All of a sudden, you know, I starts putting. Two and two together, and, and not only did I not come up with three, I came up with a summer going on here, as with our mate Lance, you know, the most tested athlete on the planet at the time. <laughs> but yeah, look, that's it. I mean, we, we had there last week, we were speaking with uh, Simona Halep in tennis, and you yeah. know, when she, you know, I worked with tennis players, and there were certain, I, I, I've always said it, and I, I got into trouble over it, where I said, we're not sending our tennis players to certain academies to train because we knew who was there. And there was there were coaches who were there, they would tell you, I have a guy watching yeah. you. I have a guy who can basically will get you so fit you can run and run and run and run and run all day long. So when you when you've got a baseliner, a good baseliner that you're managing, and you're thinking, she does well, she qualifies for a tournament, so she wins two matches, three matches. To get into the main draw, she wins the first round, but her legs are gone from the second. Now, if you can guarantee that she can make it a quarterfinal, it means she no longer has to qualify, which means that she can go, you know, she's getting more points, more money, you're making more money. So as an agent, you're like, stick it in her arm, get her running. What? Yeah. You know? Um, do you but, uh, want to finish off now? Because we, we said 10 minutes, we've been on longer, and thank you so much for, for this. I want to, uh, one of our uh, co hosts, he's right now on a train to Vladivostok. He's doing this, uh, this he, he's from Altrincham, uh, up near Manchester, of course. He's doing 10, 10k a day from Russia to the UK, and he's doing it for Football Without Borders. So he's raising money for charity. Uh, this uh, Andrew Flint. Now, uh, with Andrew, when he's doing this, um, he ran his first marathon a couple of weeks ago in Tobolsk. Uh, and I, I don't know his time, but he did quite well. I think he spent three and a half hours, under four for sure. He's running now in Vladivostok. Uh, he's doing five days on a train to get there. Uh, he, he had two questions to ask you. First, 
I'll ask them one by one. So the first question was, um, what you know, what what motivation should people have to run marathons? What would you know make them take that chance to go push themselves to the limit and beyond? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, is that, isn't it? <laughs> we all have our own reasons. Um, um, why? I don't. I, well, the, what genuinely gets me is the ones that take, without being awful, the ones that take a long time to get around a marathon. I'm amazed, me. I just couldn't. I couldn't be bothered going out and doing the training for it. I think I, you know, I'm not spending all all my time on my feet for four hours. <laughs> I give them credit for that. Uh, but motive, the motivation comes from within whatever whatever you've set your target to. Whatever you want, really, isn't it? Sorry, it's a poor answer. <laughs> you know, it's a great, it's, it's a very good answer. Look, you told the truth. It was a great one. Look, uh, the, the 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 second question you had was, I, I think it's one that a lot of us have this at certain times um, when you, I remember running fifteen hundred meters and you, being up up with the top two runners the whole way and flying along, and suddenly just bang. You know, like I, I have nothing left to give, and I've got you know half a lap to go, and I'm going to finish fourth. And I I can feel the pack coming behind me, and I'm thinking I'm on my own. But I can't. I I, I just push myself as hard as I could to to get in. Now it was it was a meaningless schools race. It was a regional schools race. I finished fourth, but there was a moment when I thought I'll step off the track, or I'll quit, or I'll fall, or I'll just let them catch me like we see it in cycling when the when the when the peloton catches with the breakaway guys question that andrew asks is what's the motivation what have you what have you used um so i guess the easiest one is when you've been running in a marathon is there a time when you've hit they say not just hit the wall but when you've hit that moment you're thinking oh for god's sake there must be something better than this and what has gotten you through it rewards thinking of rewards within my brain you know i'm kidding myself really joking myself and saying if i just get around this next corner i can stop or if i just go beyond the next bridge or or if i can catch the next person i can justify rewards or i can stop and have a beer but i'll stop and have a beer after i've finished just rewarding myself inside yeah that's how i've done it uh, just follow up with that. What, what was the hardest marathon you ran? Toughest? The toughest marathon? Oh, I don't know. I read probably the one, I think the one in 84 at New York, with the conditions being as grim as the war. You know, that were, that were hard, hard work, that war. I felt as if my insides were burning out. You know, I really, I really suffered that day, but I, I didn't quit. But it was a really, as I said, it was a tough day. I think 94 or 96% humidity, plus the temperature. I remember standing on the start line and didn't bother warming up because it was hot. And the sweat was just dripping off the nose. And I was stood outside of Rod Dixon at the time. And I looked at him and I thought, but the hell, he's sweating worse than me. <laughs> so yeah, that that were a, a, a rough day. That one, that were a bad day in the office. <laughs> That's good. It's not that note. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's been it's been it's been entertaining, educational, and informative to speak with you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, so uh, again, look, if 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 you're okay to come on next Sunday, I'll have a fella who has just run a marathon in Vladivostok. He'd love to speak with you because he's going to use your advice. Yeah, go on, go on, then I'll come on it if you want. I'm going. One reason I'll come off. I mean, I don't want you to lose viewers or anything like that, you know. <laughs> no, we trust me. You only have us gain viewers. <laughs> if we're here on our own, we cause too much mischief. Jimmy, thank you so much, and have a great weekend. All right, same to you. You take care. Bye. All right. <laughs>
And on that note, we'll say goodbye for a marathon show this evening. Of course, remember that you can check out uh, Andrew's page uh, because, of course, it's it's always important to give back to charity. And as Andrew does it every single day, he runs the 10K. On that note, I'll say thank you very much. I'm Alan Moore and wishing you all a lovely week ahead. Thank you very much for joining us here on Capital Sports 3.0.